Welcome to the Peace Catalyst podcast, where we share stories to inspire, uplift, and encourage you in your peacemaking journey. I'm Becca Teibel, and I'm joining you all from South Africa, but I am normally based in the Washington, D.C. area with Peace Catalyst. And as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Ali Bernison. Hey, everyone. I'm Ali, and I'm in Los Angeles, California. By the way, if you enjoyed the Peace Catalyst podcast, please do us a favor and take some time to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts. Yeah, thank you all so much for doing that. We're so grateful for you all and our community of listeners um, as we go along this peace building journey together. And as we continue our Becoming the Beloved Community series, Restoration and Healing in the Midst of Division, um, we're really looking forward to today's interview. And as we continue these conversations, we're talking with people whom we consider to be peace builders who are involving themselves in the Ministry of Reconciliation, interrupting and challenging oppression, and holding firmly to a vision of justice, restoration, peace, and healing for all members of community. And this concept of the beloved community is, of course, rooted in the historical origin of the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King Jr., And yeah, we're looking forward to our interview today. We sure are. So today we're interviewing Jason Porterfield, a peacemaker and author of his latest book, Fight Like Jesus, which explores the radical vision of peacemaking that Jesus embodied throughout Holy Week, taking the reader through each day of the week, unpacking the peacemaking principles and practices that might be commonly glossed over in our usual readings of the accounts leading up to Jesus's death and resurrection. So in 2007, Jason joined Servants, an international network of Christian communities living and ministering among the urban poor. He was a founding member of the Servants team in Vancouver, started a new team in Indonesia, and directed operations in North America through 2015. He holds a Master of Theology from Fuller Theological Seminary, and I'm telling you guys, I, I read this book and um, it was just such a wonderful conversation with him. So I'm really excited to share that with you. And for our peace quote today, uh, we're actually drawing it from his book. And so to give this a bit of context, this is at the beginning of his book when he's talking about Palm Sunday. And um, this is when Jesus is making his way into Jerusalem at the start of Passover. And so the crowds, you know, are shouting Hosanna and the gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus actually sheds a tear and that's in Luke 19:41. So that's important context for this quote. So here's the quote. Without this lament, it's easy to overlook that Jesus was crucified on Friday precisely because of how we, he sought to make peace on the previous days of Holy Week. And if we fail to recognize this, then despite all our familiarity with the events of Holy Week and despite clinging to the cross of Christ for our salvation, we may one day be horrified to discover that we've actually embraced a different approach to peacemaking, one that justifies killing enemies, one whose methods include nailing criminals to crosses. That's pretty powerful. I'm excited to get into this conversation. Well, hello, Jason. Thank you so, so much for being willing to join today on our podcast. Uh, There's so much to get into. I really, I want to talk about the book, uh, Fight Like Jesus. But first, would you give us, uh, would you just introduce yourself to the audience and who you are, where you're coming from, um, a bit of your background, maybe? Sure. Thanks, Ali. Yeah, it's a joy to be with you today. So, you know, I grew up uh, in a family, uh, both parents were in the military, so we kind of lived all over the place, but we eventually settled in Pennsylvania where we joined a Southern Baptist church, a church that dearly loved Jesus, dearly uh, loved the scriptures, but I would also say dearly loved their country. And so it was a very patriotic church, a Navy base and an Army base right next to the church. And then in college, I went to a, a Christian college that was at least historically was founded by the Brethren in Christ, so a historic peace church. 
And there I met uh, many Mennonite students and others who held to a nonviolent peacemaking uh, theology. And I remember, you know, many late nights grappling with them about what does it mean when Jesus says, love your enemies and, and to, to contend for peace. And, and we'd mm-hmm. talk to late in the night and then they'd pull out a card game called Dutch Blitz and everyone would get violent tackling each other to try to grab the cards from the center stack. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, while at college, I actually got roped into leading uh, a spring break missions trip uh, to Camden, New Jersey, which Camden was ranked the, the worst city in America th- uh, that year. Uh, but they were going to cancel the trip uh, if an upperclassman w- uh, couldn't go on it. And there, there had been 10 freshmen and sophomores signed up to go. So I kind of got guilt tripped into leading it. And on that trip, we met a community of Christians who all had college degrees. They all left good paying jobs and moved to what was probably the worst intersection of the worst city in the United States at the time. And there, I remember after a week with them, going back home and feeling like that's what I feel called to do. Although at the time, I felt like God was calling me to a non-Western context. So I I found myself asking, kind of like Mother Teresa used to say when people Mm. would want to come out to Calcutta, she would say, Calcuttas are everywhere. If you only have eyes to see, find your own Calcutta. And I felt that way about Camden. I felt like God was saying, the Camden, New Jerseys of the world are everywhere. If you only have eyes to see, find your Camden. And so, uh, you know, a couple of years after graduating college, I learned about a group called Servants. And Servants is an international network of Christian communities who all feel called to live and minister primarily in the slums of some of the big cities in Southeast Asia. So it was started out of New Zealand back in 1982 and had a lot of uh, Kiwis and Aussies and, and members from the UK and from Switzerland join. But they were getting growing interest from people in North America, including from myself. And so they started to ask, what would it look like to set up a sending office somewhere in North America, but where we could also try to live out the same values that we try to live out in the slums of Asia. And so they ended up starting a a community, a team in Canada's poorest urban neighborhood. It's a section of Vancouver known as the downtown east side. And so there's a couple, a few thousand homeless uh, live uh, just in a few, about four by eight city blocks. There's a lot of drug uh, issues there. Um, and just, yeah, I remember the, Uni- the United Nations once described it as a two kilometer stretch of decaying rooming houses, seedy strip bars, and shady pawn shops. And so uh, January 1st, actually, 2007, so New Year's Day, I moved uh, into that neighborhood to join that community. And I was there for three years. And the goal from the start was to ultimately form a community, a team to move and start a new team in Indonesia, which by God's grace, we did in 2010. That community is still there, although now I'm down in Houston, Texas, of all places. So that's a little bit of my background. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for for sharing about that. It's always interesting to hear where people come from and, you know, especially church traditions. And um, yeah, that. so thank you for sharing a bit about that. Um, So you have recently written this book, Fight Like Jesus, and you generously sent me a copy, but not everyone in our audience has a copy now yet. You know, we're definitely going to plug it. Um, So can you, can you just explain, you know, what, what, what is this book trying to, um, what argument or what, what is this book kind of trying to get across to, to the audience? Sure. Maybe maybe I can uh, transition into that question by telling you kind of the story behind the book. Well, in other words, why I felt compelled to write the book. That'd so, be great. So when I moved to the downtown east side, I hadn't done my homework. <laughs> I And so I, I knew about the drugs. I knew about the poverty. I knew some of the history of the neighborhood. But one of the things I didn't know was that for over 10 years, that neighborhood had been plagued with just a, a nightmare. And so three weeks after I arrived, the jury trial began for the man who we would all soon learn was Canada's deadliest serial killer, Robert Picton. And so over the course of the the previous 10 years, he would periodically drive into the downtown east side, pick up one of the many women engaged in prostitution, take her back to his pig farm, kill her, butcher her, and feed her to his pigs. And so by the time of his arrest, as he later confessed in his jail cell to an undercover cop, he had killed 49 women, just one shy of his goal. And needless to say, my neighbors were devastated. You know, Picton's victims were their friends. For many, the closest thing to family that any of them had ever known. 
Uh, they were also scared. You know, what if there was a copycat? What if the killings continued? What if he hadn't worked alone? But I think above all, they were angry and they had every right to be. You know, why had the, the police been so slow to listen to their cries for help? I mean, surely Picton, he would never have been able to kill so many people if his victims had been prominent women from the center of society. And so it didn't take long after moving to the downtown east side before my neighbor's brokenness broke me. Yeah, I moved there thinking of myself as a peacemaker. That is to say, I believe God was asking me to contend for the flourishing of this beautiful yet broken neighborhood. But pretty quickly, I realized that I was a failure of a peacemaker. I, I had no idea how to make peace. And, and this is where the book ultimately comes in. One day I dragged myself to church with what felt like my my last ounce of energy, and it turned out to be Palm Sunday. And so, like just at like at most churches, this church made it a joyous occasion. You know, so uh, people chanted Hosanna, and children paraded through the sanctuary waving palm branches. There were upbeat songs, and I just wasn't in no mood to participate. So when the sermon began, I just sat in my pew, and I remember I, I pleaded with God, and I said, God. You know, I'm failing at this, but I still believe you're in the resurrection business. I, I still believe you breathe new life into dying communities. And so my prayer was simple. I just said, God, teach me how to be a peacemaker. Mm. And this was one of those rare instances where the answer to my prayer came really fast. So when the sermon began, I, I opened my Bible and decided to read the gospel accounts of Palm Sunday. And that's when I noticed something really strange. In the gospel of Luke, it says that, as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the crowds were shouting cheers, but Jesus was shedding tears. And I had never noticed that before. Maybe it was because there were tears in my eyes that day. I'm not sure. And when he could hold back his grief no more, the scriptures tell us that Jesus cried aloud for all to hear. So we don't even have to speculate about why he was so upset. And he said, if only you knew on this of all days, the things that make for peace. I remember sitting in the pew thinking, that's that's what my prayer is. And so I realized that day, now it's taken years to flesh it out, and that's what this book is about. But I realized on that day, all those years ago, that if I was ever going to be effective at, at confronting injustice, calling out oppressors, and, and contending for peace, then right. I needed to study the greatest peacemaker's greatest week. And so in mm-hmm. the book, I, I argue that um, Holy Week is best understood when viewed through the lens of peacemaking. And that 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 lament that Jesus gave on Palm Sunday is the interpretive key to understanding everything he did, that each day he contended for our peace, and each day he sought to correct the misguided methods we go about using to make and maintain peace. And in fact, to add to it, I the book also makes the claim that if you want to be equipped as practitioners of Jesus' approach to peacemaking, that there's probably no better place to look than Holy Week. So yes, Jesus had a lot to say throughout his years of public ministry about how to make peace. But the beautiful thing about Holy Week is that it's the main stage on which we get to see Jesus put all of his previous peace teaching into action. And that's what I needed in the downtown east side. You know, um, in the messiness of that neighborhood, I knew I was supposed to love my enemies and love my neighbor. But how do you love your enemy when your enemy is currently oppressing your neighbor? What does that look like? You know, these abstract principles, I needed to see them find concrete expression. uh, And that's what we see in Holy Week. So the book goes through each day of Holy Week, Palm Sunday, even Saturday, Easter Sunday, and it pulls out of it uh, peacemaking lessons for us. Huh. Huh. Yeah. Such a, such a unique take on Holy Week, just meaning that I've never, I've, I've never thought of Holy Week within the lens of, um, or th- seen it through the lens of peacemaking. And I mean, this question might be a bit speculative, but but why do you think that is? Why do you think that we don't talk about Holy Week, you know, through through this lens and we maybe focus on, um, we focus on Jesus's death, but then of course, mainly on his resurrection and the victory and what that means. Um, but not necessarily the days before, which I want to get into and definitely ask you some questions about. But but yeah, why do you think this is kind of missing within our, and maybe I'm speaking a bit too broadly, but um, but yeah, generally, generally, why 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 are we not focusing on Holy Week as um, as seeing Jesus's peacemaking lessons kind of practiced and and lived out? Yeah, great question, Ali. You know, 
on the one hand, it's it's hard for me to fathom how have did I and most of us mm-hmm. miss Jesus's tears on, on Palm Sunday. You know, why when we commemorate Palm Sunday, why do our emotions match the crowd's glee instead of our Savior's grief? Uh, I don't have a great answer for that, but on the in the broader question of why have we not looked at Holy Week this way, I think a lot of it has to do is because we are in a rush to get to what we think of as the main event, the cross. And, you know, when Jesus spoke of things in the plural that make for peace, he revealed that his peacemaking efforts could not be reduced to one solitary act. So I think I used to brush aside that lament because I thought I already knew what it was alluding to. It's the cross. The cross mm-hmm. is how Jesus makes peace. And and I still believe that's true. I mean, it's wonderfully true, foundationally true. It's just not the whole truth. And, um, mm. and so, you know, think about how maybe the churches you've been a part of, how have they commemorated Holy Week? Most that I've been a part of, they celebrate Palm Sunday and then they do nothing else until Friday comes around, or at best, Thursday evening. They might have a Monday Thursday service. And as a result, the events of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, they get brushed aside as incidental. Mm-hmm. The, the interesting thing, though, is the gospel writers, they actually front-loaded their coverage of the week. So Tuesday of Holy Week is actually the most talked-about day in the, all of the Gospels, let alone Holy Week. So Matthew mm-hmm. has more to say about Tuesday than all the other days of Holy Week combined, for example. But that's not yeah. how we normally go about Holy Week. And to tie this back into your initial question, when we when we rush ahead to the cross, you know, I think in our in our passion to lift up the cross, we fail to realize that we've actually uprooted it from its context and we've severed mm-hmm. the cross from the life of the one who gives it meaning. And so the irony is we think we're making much of the cross, but we're actually diminishing its significance. So Mm -hmm. we fail to realize that Jesus was crucified on Friday precisely because of how he contended for peace on the previous days. And my deep concern is when we fail to realize that, we may claim that we're clinging to the cross of Christ for our salvation, while in actuality we've embraced the very approach to peacemaking that justified nailing him to that cross. Hmm. Wow. Wow. I, yeah, I want to definitely want to get more into that. Um, but well, yeah, let's talk about Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So okay. yeah, on, I think um, I was, when I was reading through the book, you po- aptly pointed out, you know, many people might point to what happened on Monday with Jesus, um, Jesus's use of the whip, and to drive out the money changers and animal sellers um, as kind of evidence of, okay, wait, J- you know, even Jesus got, and that's how I've heard of that whole episode. That's how I've heard it talked about is even Jesus got angry. Even Jesus, you know, was sometimes, um, sometimes punished or, or was violent or just his anger was displayed maybe in a, in a potentially aggressive slash violent way. Um, so but you make the claim in the book that actually this advances our understanding of how Jesus makes peace. So what what causes you to say this and how are you seeing that um, episode in the in the Gospels? Yeah, great question. Yeah, you know, most books on peacemaking, a lot of them are apologetic in nature in the sense that they they seek to address the objections raised by those who don't hold to a nonviolent peacemaking stance. Um, and that's not this book, but two of the main passages that people point out when they say, ah, Jesus got violent, was the temple cleansing on Monday of Holy Week yeah. and on Thursday of Holy Week when he tells his disciples in this shocking scene, you know, if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. Uh, and so it's interesting that, you know, in the book, I, I take those passages head on um, and try to show how they actually, like you said, advance our understanding of peacemaking. You know, I'm not trying to just neutralize a, a seemingly problematic text for those of us who call ourselves peacemakers. I'm trying to show how it actually advances our understanding of peacemaking. So with the temple cleansing, um, the gospel writers divided it into three phases. So there's the, the preparation the evening before. So at the end of the triumphal entry, it says he goes and he looks around the temple. He assesses the situation like we all should, <laughs> uh, you know, exegete our neighborhoods mm-hmm. when we move into a place, assess it, take time, um, assess before you act. And then he goes back to Bethany for the night. So he has all night to think about how he's going to respond based on what he just saw. So mm-hmm. already that contradicts the usual depiction we're given, the portrayal we're given, that when Jesus goes into the temple on Monday, he's he just 
you know, something causes him, like I joke in the book, to have a massive temple tantrum. You know, he he just uh, loses it and he goes berserk. Uh, but that's not actually what the gospel writers say. You know, his actions were calculated and planned, not rash and, and impetuous. And so um, in the, the section on the action itself, I look at the evidence for did Jesus whip people or just the animals? And only the Gospel of John mentions a whip. Uh, And so Mm -hmm. that's the passage we look at. And so I look at the evidence, you know, um, about the whip itself. It says that Jesus made the whip. He constructed the whip once he was already in the temple. And it even names the material he used. It it was uh, a material like reeds or rushes akin to like wicker material that we'd use today. So, okay. you know, years ago when I when I saw that, like all good millennials, you know, I went to Amazon. I bought 200 feet of wicker material, you know, free two-day shipping, and then immediately felt guilty for supporting Amazon. Uh, and then <laughs> <laughs> uh, when it arrived, you know, I think I put on the Indiana Jones trilogy and uh, sat down with my kids and tried, you know, took my time to make the most intimidating whip I possibly could. And mm-hmm. uh you know, in the end, I think people would have just fallen over laughing instead of fleeing in fear based on my whip. And, mm. you know, the earliest uh, manuscripts we have for the Gospel of John, they actually include a little Greek word, the, the Greek word hos, which uh, it's used, for example, when it says Jesus sweats something like drops of blood when he was praying uh, in the garden on Thursday. And so here it's saying Jesus constructed something like a whip, a, a pseudo whip, a whip of sorts, you know. So maybe his whip was actually a lot more like my pseudo whips, you know. Um, right. But we also have good evidence for what what materials would have been in the temple. And so the the leading theory for where Jesus found this wicker-like material is that it was the bedding used for the sheep and the cattle. And so that means he would have been with the animals. And we know from historical records that sheep and cattle were often herded uh, using this sort of whip-like implement, that, pr- primarily by whacking the ground to make a noise, actually. Huh. Um And so we have that evidence. There's also the temple security. Uh, Pontius Pilate brought in reinforcements for Passover since it had a the week long festivities had a a history of inciting revolt. Since it, you know, the Passover is about remembering God's historic liberation of the people of Israel from an oppressive superpower. Um, And so he had to bring in reinforcements. So he came to the city bringing in reinforcements, and many of them were stationed at the tower, Fortress Atonia, which looks down into the temple so they could actually see everything going on. So it's hard to explain why they wouldn't have intervened if uh, Jesus had violently used the whip on the animal sellers and the money changers. But ultimately, the main evidence is the Greek itself. And so without getting too bogged down in details, you know, the key verse is John two fifteen, where it says, and making a whip out of cords, Jesus drove all, uh, drove out of the temple all. And then it has this little Greek word, t. Uh, the sheep, kai, which just means and, the cattle. And so you have to ask yourself, how do you translate that to mm-hmm. noun, kai noun construction? And the cool thing is, and a number of other scholars have looked at this too, um, is that that, now, that uh, phrase, to noun, kai noun, it's used 90 times in the New Testament. And in every mm-hmm. other time, it's clearly being used to tell us what the the word it's modifying. So in our case, the word all, it, it's used to to list what that noun was comprised of. In other words, in this passage, it's saying Jesus drove out of the temple all. What was the all comprised of? Both the sheep and the cattle. And so mm-hmm. as a number of other scholars have pointed out, to translate it as Jesus drove out of the temple all along with the sheep and the cattle, so that would mean it he right. whipped people. Uh, you'd have to translate it in a way it's never translated anywhere else. Um, mm-hmm. And so there, there's other evidence we look at, but that's a quick overview. But that's, mm-hmm. that maybe neutralizes the passage. But in the chapter, I'd then try to say, you know, Jesus still appears angry. And aggressive, even if he's right. not whipping people, he's still flipping over right. tables. He's giving the the dove sellers a tongue lashing, at least, you know. So, how do we make sense of this? How does this advance our understanding of peacemaking? And so, I, I tell an analogy of you know, say a mom gets off work early uh, and comes home, opens up her front door, and sees that her teenage son and his friends are high, say on opioids or something, uh, and she immediately just instinctively responds. She grabs the pill bottle off the table, flips over the card table or the coffee table they had been on, goes in the bathroom, 
pours the pills into the toilet, flushes it down, comes back out and looks her son and his friends in the eyes and, you know, says, your bodies are made in the image of God. Stop destroying them with these drugs. Now, none of us would say that this mom's actions were violent or incorrect. In fact, we would accuse this mother of negligence if she hadn't intervened. And what Mm -hmm. if that's the same about Jesus. You know, was that mother angry, assertive, and aggressive? Yeah. You know, I suppose you could say so. Was Jesus angry, assertive, and aggressive? Yeah. I suppose you could say so. But I think this passage reveals what Gandhi said about Jesus, that Jesus was the most active resistor of injustice in human history. So it Mm. teaches us that when it comes to peacemaking or uh, pacifism can never should never be conflated with passivism. In other words, uh, mm. a refusal to use violence is never a refusal to act. That's mm. what we learn, or one of the lessons we learn from the temple cleansing on Monday. Hmm. That yeah, that totally makes sense, and it and it connects to something that you said about what happens on Tuesday, um, which there's I mean there's a ton to unpack there. So you know, feel free to jump in with other things that I'm that I'm not touching on, but something that struck me as I was reading that section was uh, your comments on Jesus's remarks about Caesar. And um, yeah, the question there for, for me that comes up is, you know, when the Caesars of the world order us to do something that would harm or oppress others, you know, we must not obey. And um, yeah, that just, that reminds me of what we were, we were just talking about with, with the temple cleansing, how Jesus is an active um, resistor of, of um, injustice. And I forget exactly how you said that or how Gandhi said that. Um, but so, so how do you see this disobedience or, you know, refusing to obey the Caesars of the world? If, if, if what they're asking and what they're, what they're doing by effect is harming others, how do you see this, this, disobedience or however you would say that, um, serving as a principle of peacemaking, actually. Sure. So civil disobedience as sure. a principle of peacemaking. Yeah. So the, the passage you're, you're speaking about on Tuesday is, so Jesus actually has the audacity to go back to the temple, you know, after what he did there on Monday. And uh, this time, it's the, the temple authorities that take the initiative and they try to trap Jesus with a series of baited questions in hopes yeah. of getting his supporters to turn on him because they're afraid if they arrest him while he has all this support, you know, it's not going to go well for them. So they try to trap him. And one of the questions is, is it right to pay the tax to Caesar, the poll tax to Caesar? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Uh, and without getting bogged down in too much of the details, you know, his, his ultimate answer, answer is that classic, uh, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God's. Uh, the Greek verb there, he actually switches the word. They ask, is it right to pay? And he switches it to return or to repay, to give back. So his answer, to not use the word render, is actually uh, give back to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God right. the things that are God's. And so... What he's ultimately done there is he said, to answer your question, you have to answer a more fundamental question, namely, what belongs to God and what belongs to Caesar? You can't return something to someone unless you first know to whom it belongs, right? Uh, And so uh, any Jew with even a cursory understanding of the scriptures would have known uh, that a mantra that runs throughout the Hebrew scriptures is everything belongs to God. Uh, and so actually the temple authorities, they interpret that to mean that Jesus then is saying not to pay the tax. It's one of the things they accuse of him of when they arrest him. Um, the, you know, the New Testament writers gave a more nuanced answer. So for example, in the book of Acts, uh, they, they say we, we must obey God rather than man. So it's more what, what you were saying, you know, wh- when is it that we must not obey when Caesar's ask us to do something? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think a, a, a helpful passage to look at for that is actually Paul in Romans 13. Uh, he's actually addressing a very similar situation. Nero had just revised the tax law code, uh, and a number of Jews in Rome were revolting. And it, and the theory is that the Christians were were uh, considering joining them in that tax revolt. Mm-hmm. So Paul's addressing that situation. And this passage is actually usually used to dismiss 
uh, nonviolent forms of peacemaking. So it starts out with Paul saying uh, that we must submit ourselves to the governing authorities. And he doesn't use the word obey. He uses the word submit, which me- which is a word that means um, whether one uh, obeys or must respectfully disobey. That's what mm. a submission is. And so a classic case of uh of submissive disobeying would be the early Mm -hmm. Christians who refused to bow down to Caesar's gods yet prayed for him as he was feeding them to his wild Mm -hmm. animals. You know, that's a beautiful example of, of submissive disobedience. Uh, But in that passage, Paul goes on to say, you know, pay the tax to who the taxes do and the custom to who the custom is due. Um, But then he gives basically a litmus test or he draws a line in the sand that basically says, if the Caesars of this world uh, ask us to do this, we must not obey. And so uh, right after saying, pay the tax to whom the taxes do, that's verse seven, verse eight, he says, but ultimately you owe no one anything but love. And then just in case love is too ambiguous of a concept, he defines it uh, in verse 10. He says, and love does no harm to another. Mm -hmm. So in other words, Paul is saying, if someone says that you owe it to them, if your governing authorities say that you owe it to them to cause harm to another, usually someone that's not part of your country or or despised within your country, right, Uh, that you don't owe it to them. You must respectfully Mm -hmm. and submissively disobey. Because ultimately, everything belongs to God. And so, you know, Jesus, uh, he used the mantra, the kingdom of God. And he could have spoken, like uh, Marcus Borg likes to say, he could have spoken of, of the people of God, the community of God, the fellowship of God. But he chose a politically loaded slogan, the kingdom right. of God. Um, and so the early Christians said, you know, our, well, kind of like Bonhoeffer, our hearts only have room for for one all-encompassing allegiance. And so the Christians would say, you know, we can't serve God and Caesar. Uh, the early Christians said that uh, we can only pledge our allegiance to King Jesus. Uh, and so that's what I would say in answer to that question. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. So much there. And yeah, I love how you're how you're bringing in um, so much more than just the gospels, but yeah, Paul's understandings and uh, anyway. um, Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, So when you are, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this is also Tuesday, the woes. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, So as you're, as you're talking about the woes, you mention a metaphor about sailing that illustrates our experience of God's love. And I just, first of all, I, I think it was from a, prof, a former professor and I, and I love that metaphor. So maybe you can briefly explain that. Um, and, but you use, you use this to explain how the intention behind the Beatitudes um, uh, during the Sermon on the Mount and the woes is the same or similar. And so you're basically saying that, God's heart is ultimately always to restore. And so can you explain a bit, um, just give, give us some understanding of, of what you mean by that and how you see this maybe even in, in your own community or church or, or just global church? Like how do we tend to speak truth to power in a way that condemns and judges or in a way that uplifts and restores and, um, yeah, and maybe you know, just starting with, what do you mean when you're when you're talking about the parallels between the beatitudes and woes, just in terms of intention? Sure. Yeah. Great questions. Um, so after the religious leaders in the temple try and fail four times to trap Jesus with a, those baited questions, he then goes on the initiative and he launches into a lengthy critique that culminates in what's often called the seven woes, uh, and that's uh, the passage where, you know, it often repeats the line, uh, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And then it goes into a list of, of woes. And right. those woes can seem pretty harsh, even though, you know, the Greek word for woe, it, it connotes a, a, a sorrowful warning. Um, there's deep sorrow in that, um, in that word. Uh, but the interesting thing is the way the woes function uh, in the greater context of Matthew's gospel is that the very first thing Jesus teaches when he starts his public ministry in the Matthew, in Matthew's gospel is uh, the Beatitudes. Uh, 
And the very last thing Jesus teaches publicly are the seven woes. Hmm. So they function like bookends to Jesus's public ministry. And like all matching bookends, they face in opposite directions. So they hmm. seem, they don't seem like they'd have anything in common. But when you look at the various, the individual beatitudes, and then you look at the woes, uh, they seem to often be saying the opposite of one another. So let me see if I can remember some of these now. It's been a while since I wrote that chapter, but, uh, you know, sure. uh, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Well, the first woe says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, because you're refusing to let the poor enter God's kingdom. You know, hmm. and, and the final beatitude talks about, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. The final woe uh, warns the scribes and Pharisees that they are persecuting the righteous one. They're about to put to death the righteous one. Uh, and so there's a, a massive parallels between the two lists. Right. Um and so in the chapter, I ask, you know, the content isn't as easy to understand, but it's the intention behind those woes. What's the intention? You know, was Jesus uh, basically uh, justifying the punishment he was about to impose on them? That's how historically many Christian groups have used this, this passage. Um, yeah. Often to persecute the Jewish communities, uh, quite tragically. Um, or was this Jesus seeking to call out their hypocrisy in hopes that they would repent and turn around. And so like you said, I, I, I share an analogy from my very first prof in seminary, Dr. Gary Detto, where he, he, he loved to sail. And uh, he told the story of, of uh, going to sail to, is it Catalina Island that's off LA? I'm trying to remember my geography yeah. now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he said, you know, we, we departed early one morning and we sailed, what would it be, uh, due west toward the island. And he said, and we were sailing with the wind. And when, as we sailed with the wind, because we were going at the same speed as the wind, it felt like there was no breeze, right? Mm. Everything was quiet. The The ocean feel, felt smooth because we were moving at the same pace as the windswept waves. You could hear the birds calling in the air, the sun soaking your back, but they ran out of time. And so they actually had to turn around uh, and start heading back the, in the other direction, which supposedly you can actually do in a very good sailboat. You can kind of zigzag at 45 degree angles. Hmm. Um and he said, as soon as we turned around and st started to go against that wind, our experience of the day suddenly changed. Suddenly the waves were crashing against our boat. Wave after wave were getting drenched and soaked in the roar of the wind and the flapping of the sails. And he said, you know, mm -hmm. you would have sworn that Mother Nature had just unleashed all her fury on us. But the only thing that had actually changed was us, that we chose to go against the wind. And, and that's what mm -hmm. I like in the seven woes to, you know, um, God's love is like the wind. It's always blowing. It's always moving us toward God and seeking to move us toward, a, you know, a better way of living toward, you know, as Peace Catalyst likes to say, towards that shalom uh, right. that God intends uh, for all communities, the flourishing, right? But we can resist God's love. And when we do, uh, we, we may swear that God's unleashed all his fury on us, Um but what if it's actually only us that's changed? You know, uh, God's love hasn't changed at all. It's still willing our good. It's still seeking to move us toward peace. Yeah. Uh, and so that's what I, I talk about uh, in that section. Hmm. And I point out that afterwards, that's what Jesus likens it to. He, he himself says, I've said these woes because I'm like, you know, get this, of all things, I'm like a mother hen trying mm -hmm. to gather my wayward chicks under my wings. Um, and in fact, some of the religious leaders do repent and turn. Um, we know um, Joseph of Arimathea and um, oh, I'm so bad with names. Uh, Nicodemus. They they do ultimately. There's evidence and fruit uh, in their lives that it seems that mm -hmm. they did turn uh, and move back toward God. So in the passage, I say, you know, what's the peacemaking lesson for this? Um, and it's certainly speaking truth to power, um, but this. That can be abused, especially for those of us we, who I think we have to admit are in positions of power. And so for me, the main takeaway, which I also you know talk about in the chapter, is that we need to be willing to listen and humbly consider when mm -hmm. others speak truth to us. <laughs> you know, they don't mm -hmm. have to necessarily speak with respect. They might be full of hurt and emotion. Uh, you know, Jesus certainly was quite sorrowful and passionate in his words. Yeah. But will we have the humility to listen when such truth is spoken over us? Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, I, you know, there's, there's so many more things I want to get into. Um, and I, I do want to talk about the cross and 
Yeah, I, I, yeah, I definitely want to get to Sunday. However, I do have another question. I think about, I think this was still on Tuesday. Okay. Um, Mark, Mark 13, 5 through 23, uh, which, you know, we've used the, um, the des the desolation and the kind of the um, you better get ready the the passage that's typically been understood by some in Christian circles as you know this is a predictor of the end times here's what to expect wars and famines and um, and that's how I always within my tradition growing up that's that's how that passage was explained um, is this is when Jesus is talking about the end of the world and so I. Yeah, I, I guess I do want to briefly get into your understanding of this passage and specifically, you know, how how it connects to practices of peace. Um, yeah, if we could. Sure, yeah. So this is at the, it's the final scene of Tuesday, this long, okay. exhausting day, right? So after those seven woes, uh, Jesus and his disciples leave the temple never to return again, uh, at least for Jesus. And uh, you can just imagine the collective sigh of relief that the disciples would have felt, you know, to, to go back to the temple after what happened on Monday. Uh, and so for them to escape unharmed, you know, to be able to leave the temple, is, uh, you get the sense that they were just uh, overjoyed. And so this is where it, uh, in the Gospels it has them saying, looking around at the buildings and saying, look at these magnificent buildings, you know, um, how beautiful they are. And, uh, and Jesus says, uh, this is where Jesus then talks about how uh, not one stone will remain on top of the other, but they'll all be torn down about the mm -hmm. temple. In other words, the temple is going to be destroyed. And uh, the gospel writers actually record nothing else from the disciples until they then make it to uh, the Mount of Olives and sit down mm -hmm. to rest uh, as they're going back to Bethany for the night. So you get the sense that it just deflated them, like just took the life out of the party, <laughs> you know, uh, that comment. So then while they're sitting there, look, and from there, actually on the Mount of Olives, you can look across the Kidron Valley and you have this beautiful panoramic view of the temple. Um, and so they would have been able to see the whole temple complex. And they asked Jesus, when is this going to happen? Uh, the temple, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And that's when he gives this lengthy answer that uh, scholars often call the passage, the little apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this is one that um, in the middle of the, I'm trying to get my dates right here, the 19th century, uh, an Irish priest named John Nelson Darby uh, took this passage and he was the first person to ever propose what's now called, uh, let me get this right, premillennial dispensationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's this, uh, there's a lot of nuance to it, but basically the argument was that things have to get much worse before Christ returns and there's a thousand year reign. But uh, before things get really bad, God will rescue his people uh, through, yeah. um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, the rapture. There the we rapture, go. <laughs> yeah, right. um, and, uh, and so Darby's eschatology, in other words, his theology of the end times, uh, it didn't catch on too much in the UK, but it got quite a following in America. And then um, a lawyer named Schofield actually created his Schofield study Bible, and he basically put Darby's eschatological beliefs in the footnotes. So when people wanted to read the commentary on a passage, they look down and there's Darby's eschatology presented as undisputed fact. Things have to get worse. Um, uh, Israel needs to regain the Holy Land, all, right. all this stuff. And and then, you know, World War One, World War II happened, and it seems to confirm this eschatology. And so by the end of World War II, the Schofield Study Bible was the number one study Bible in the U.S. How um, interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, but it's interesting, though, we ought to be wary of, of new theological claims that didn't exist for the first 1,800 years of church history, right? No <laughs> yeah. one interpreted yeah. uh, Mark 13 or Matthew's account of it uh, in this way before Darby. And, and so in the chapter, I, I first talk about how even though it's an eschatology, in other words, by its very nature, it's about the future, it has had harmful consequences in the present. And I list some of those. But ultimately, we look at the passage itself, because that's not how the early church understood that passage. And it's not even... Uh, to interpret it in that way, you have to strip it from the context. In other words, yeah. you have to remove it from the question that prompted the answer, namely, when is the temple going to be destroyed? And, and to be honest, on this, most scholars are in agreement, which is, you can't always say, um, mm -hmm. but most scholars would say that this passage is about the Jewish-Roman war. Um, 
Now, I, you know, I don't say this in the book, but um, Ched Meyer is another author who wrote a great book called Binding the Strong Man. It's a commentary on Mark's gospel. He talks about apocryphal texts. He says the beautiful thing about apocryphal texts is that um, they're both highly contextual and transferable. And I think he means it's kind of like the Psalms. You know, the, each song in the Psalms was written because of a specific specific event for the songwriter, for David or, right. you know, the psalmist. Um, but we can apply them to our own lives and to our own situations. And that's the same. Mm-hmm. That's the beauty of apocryphal text. So even though it was likely written about the Jewish Roman war, it teaches all of us how to live when the world erupts into war around us. And so it says mm-hmm. things like nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. But you, it goes on to say, uh, you will not be part of either group. In other words, Mm. you won't be part of the warring nations and kingdoms. Rather, you're going to be brought before your fellow countrymen in the synagogues, it says, and before uh, kings and others before the Roman Empire as well on account of me. All sides are going to hate you because of your refusal to participate in what was Mm. a very, very bloody battle. Um, there's a lot of historical details that cause scholars to think this passage is about the Jewish Roman war, but in a nutshell, basically twice it looked like Rome was going to get Jerusalem back and twice what seemed like a a miracle, they suddenly retreated. And so there was this window of time uh, around the time of, of 68, 69 AD where the Jewish people thought, man, God's miraculously saved us twice, but everyone knew Rome's going to return. Um, and they're going to try to finish the job, which they did. Um, but during that in-between time, a lot of uh, historical writings outside of the Bible talk about these pseudo-false messiahs that came along. And in order to gain, uh, to, in order to conscript people to join their, the fight against Rome, uh, they would allude to uh, famine and earthquakes and these signs that that is the end times. This is the final battle we must fight for God's behalf. Right. And interestingly, you know, Mark wrote his gospel account right around this time. And a lot, because of this passage, a lot of scholars think he wrote it during this in-between time, right before Rome returned and ultimately destroyed Jerusalem. And he's re- evidently he felt the need to remind the church community of what Jesus had said uh, on Tuesday of Holy Week. And ultimately, they did remember because there's historical accounts that uh, in the passage, it, Jesus says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation, flee to the hills. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, that's that euphemism, that cryptic phrase, abomination that causes desolation. It was first used in the book of Daniel to refer to a time when when uh, the Seleucid king uh, slaughtered a pig and spread its blood throughout the temple and defiled the temple with blood. Well, uh, there's no shortage of events from the Jewish Roman war that it could be alluding to, but Jesus Hmm. is basically saying when you see blood in the temple once again, and in fact that happened on Passover in 70 AD, which if you date Jesus's crucifixion in 30 AD, the other option is 33 AD. But if it was in 30 AD, that would be the 40th anniversary of Jesus's crucifixion. The temple hmm. uh, has blood in it again. The slaughtering is actually Jews hmm. killing other Jews. These rival Jewish factions, but the early Christians um, fled before Rome returned and slaughtered the people in Jerusalem, and they fled to the foothills of Judea uh, to a town called Pella, and so they did not participate in the fighting, just like the passage says. And so I, you know, I look at that in the chapter, and ultimately, actually. Jesus then tells a couple, a series of parables about staying awake, be ready. And it culminates uh, with that classic sheep and goats passage. You know, I was hungry and you fed me. I was uh, sick and you visited me, et cetera. And in context, what Jesus is saying is if you don't want to become entranced by the drumbeats of war, if you don't want to get caught up uh, when the world around you just seems to erupt into fighting, then the way to stay awake is to get, engage in small everyday acts of peacemaking on a daily basis. You know, which of us can't uh, give food to someone who's hungry? And it's not alleviate all hunger. It, it's you know, share a meal right. with one person. Visit. It doesn't say heal the sick. It says visit the sick. Um, and so I think that's the takeaway from that hmm. whole series of passages. Hmm. The peacemaking practices yeah. starts start somewhere. Yeah. So, you know, Jesus says nation's going to rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, but not you. 
Um, you need to stay awake. Don't become entranced. Don't fall asleep and, and, and participate. And here's how. Uh, mm-hmm. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was sick, you visited me, et cetera. Uh, this mm-hmm. is how you stay awake, at least in the context of what comes before the sheep and goats passages. That seems to be what Jesus is saying. Yeah. So interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I hope that we can kind of close with talking about the cross and resurrection, which yes, <laughs> arguably, I mean, yeah, but before reading this book, I'd be like, well, that's, that should be the whole conversation. But anyway, um, so yeah, f- I think it's, it's probably necessary to talk about the cross because that affects, you know, how we are to live in light of it, um, as people of peace and, um, yeah, in the here and now, like how, how does that affect our, our view of God and how we live as peacemakers in our local communities? Um, but first talking about the cross. Um, so, you know, some, some of us might be familiar with, um, a certain atonement theory that says, you know, God, that the cross was necessary because God poured out his anger on Jesus, um, kind of his divine wrath or judgment. And, um, that through that we are now reconciled, we're wiped clean. Um, and so I, I'm wondering how you see the cross as an instrument of peace and how, how it might be important for us to reframe our understanding of who Jesus was and his mission and who, and who, what his mission was in order to understand that, um, the cross was an instrument of peace. And, um, this doesn't necessarily have to affect the way that you answer, obviously, but if I could just read one excerpt of the book, because it, um, it stuck out to me. So the significance should not be lost on us that Jesus had an opportunity to die like a scapegoat on the day of atonement. Yet he chose instead to lay down his life on Passover. The day of atonement is about forgiveness. Passover on the other hand is about liberation. On the first Passover, God liberated the people of Israel from Egyptian enslavement, but giving the Israelites their life back was was only the beginning of their liberation journey. They spent the next 40 years wandering the desert as God worked tirelessly to liberate them from their harmful ways of living and mistaken beliefs about what God is like. So I thought that was interesting, just getting into, you know, God is not a hammer and um, the, the point about, you know, Jesus could have died on the day of atonement, certainly, but he but that's not the case. It, um, yeah. And Passover is about liberation actually. So anyway, what is, what does that have to do with the cross? And, um, yeah. How, do, how do you see the cross as an instrument of peace is the main question. That was a lot of, a lot of revving up to the question. <laughs> yeah. You know, as I, as I really, as I wrote the whole book, but especially as I was working on Friday's chapter, I often thought about something pastor and writer Brian Zond often says, and that is when it comes to the cross, let's readily confess it, but never glibly explain it. Hmm. Um, And so, um, you know, one of the things I hope to do with this book was um, to make much of the cross by giving the the attention the first half of Holy Week deserves. So the gospel writers actually only dedicate 6% of their coverage of Holy Week to the cross itself. So I think we're actually making much of the cross when mm. we place it in its context. And that's partly because um, the, the cross is more than just something that Jesus endured for our sake, as important and as foundational as that is. Right. I'm not denying that. But the cross is also the end result of a way of living that we're called to imitate it's the culmination of how Jesus makes peace, that he's willing to be killed, but not to kill. Uh, and on the cross, there is an element of forgiveness. Yes, uh, he's killed on Passover, a, a festival that's all about liberation. There is an element of forgiveness to it, though. Remember, he says on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And as right. Desmond Tutu so often said, you know, there's no future without forgiveness. And, uh, you know, when Friday came to a close, people probably all thought, that's the end. Uh, but the the thing about forgiveness is that it has this uncanny ability to create a future when none seemed possible. Now, in this chapter, you talked about at- atonement theories. Um, and a, a dominant one that you alluded to is, is called, you know, this penal substitution, right? And that's what I was taught growing up. I'm guessing that's probably what you were taught growing up. Um, I When I wrote this chapter, I purposefully did not try to make a case for any one uh, sure. a th- atonement theory over others. Um, now I'm 
completely uh, see substitutionary atonement as one of the metaphors in the New Testament to explain how the cross brings us peace. Jesus is our substitute on the cross. Um, I would question the penal aspect. You know, the Paul says the wages of sin is death. He doesn't say the punishment for sin. It's an economic uh, metaphor. It's not a judicial one. Um, but there's other metaphors. Jesus as healer, Jesus as what's called a Christus victor. He's the victor over Satan and over the principalities and powers right. uh, on the cross. So there's a whole bunch of metaphors. And, and really what I strive to do was not unpack a systematic theology of the cross on Friday, but rather to put a boundary. I, I thought of it as a boundary theology. So in other words, I wanted to name a boundary which in, within which all acceptable theories of the atonement should lie within. Because uh, the thing with biblical metaphors is it's really easy to stretch metaphors beyond where they were meant to go. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the boundary I name uh, in the chapter is that is that of if we our understanding of how the cross works causes uh, causes us to pit God the Father against Jesus the Son, then we've misunderstood the cross. You know, the gospels say that it was because God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son, and that on the cross, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So any interpretation of how the cross works that pits the father against the son, that says um, that the father must unleash the punishment we deserve upon his son, and the son is the merciful. God the father is the holy just one who must right. punish sin, and Jesus is the merciful one who protects us uh, and saves us from God, you know? Um, so yeah. if our understanding of the cross has Jesus saving us from God instead of from our sins, we've misunderstood it. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm curious how, um, yeah, how, how does all of that, um, what Jesus did on the cross, how, what his ministry looked like, especially, you know, as we've talked about during Holy Week, the, the, the principles and practices of peacemaking that he taught and lived. Um, how do we, how are we the people of the resurrection? Um, how, how are we meant to cultivate the future promised by God in the messiness of the here and now? And um, yeah, yeah, maybe that's a good, good final question. Yeah, you know, books like this one, I think, are best processed in community. And I think that's mm. the question that every community has to ask itself. And there's going to be some unique answers given the uniqueness of, of your locality, you know, where you are. Um, and so I guess the one thing I would say on that question is, um, is that uh, it takes a... a our efforts to to contend for peace they're they're forever going to be stunted unless we do it as part of a community um, mm -hmm. and that's because you know on your own you can talk about peace and you can demand justice but in community you can actually embody peace embody mm -hmm. justice uh, you can do justice right and then in community you can welcome others in and to actually experience that peace to experience God's love and so I think when it comes to to being a people that seeks, uh, you're, you're quoting, I think it was Justin Martyr, he, he said of the church, we are the people who seek to cultivate in the present the future that was promised to us by the crucified one. And, and that's what it means to be a resurrected people, to be a people of the resurrection, in other words. Um, we are to be the people who say, okay, in the kingdom of God, we love our enemies, we seek to cultivate God's shalom, especially in those places where it's painfully absent. And so right. we are going to be a community that seeks to live out that reality now. Uh, a number of theologians talk about this, Scott McKnight, uh, N.T. Wright, I mean, many, you know, that say we are outposts of God's kingdom on earth. Uh, and so we, um, instead of lamenting and saying, oh, uh, you know, one day, one day when Christ returns, we can be like this. Uh, the church right. is supposed to be the people who say, how can we live that out now? Hmm. Hmm. And I love what you said about, um, it, it's something that we do that question of like, how are we people of resurrection is something that we, we ask and we consider within community. Um, and that, you know, it, it's contextual. It depends on, on where you're located and, um, 
yeah, who you're practicing peace with and, you know, where, where you see injustice and where you're trying to cultivate, um, yeah, furthering God's kingdom of justice and peace. And so I think that's, um, yeah, I, I just, I really appreciate that, uh, encouragement. So is there, yeah, is there anything else that you might want to add or, um, end with to encourage people? I don't know. Is there any, is there anything else that you might want to add or contribute to this conversation just as a final end? Yeah. Thanks for that opportunity. Uh, I guess what comes to mind is one of the lessons I pull out from Saturday, this often called silent Saturday. And that's just, I mean, let's be honest, you know, peacemaking can be hard, discouraging work. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. the destructive forces plaguing our communities just seem unstoppable. Um, and we, I, I wish we had time to unpack a theology of, of Holy Saturday, but you know, one of the things Saturday does teach us is that sometimes on, on the very days when Jesus seems most lifeless may actually be when he's most actively contending for our peace. You know, the, the mm. Orthodox church, when they, when they show paintings of Jesus's resurrection, it's not just him on his own. It's, he is leading a, uh, a line, a, a, a trail of, of liberated souls coming out of Hades. You know, that, that according to the Orthodox church and some passages in the new Testament is what Jesus was doing on Saturday. Um, mm. And so I guess the thing I'd, I'd leave everyone with is just, um, you know, the reality of Holy Saturday, it doesn't lead us to just deny the reality of death and suffering around us. Rather, it gives us the courage to remain immersed in such realities. And so mm -hmm. I would just encourage you to, to press on, you know, on the days yeah. when God seems most absent, press on. It may turn out that that's when he's most actively at work, you know, press on. Ultimately, as uh, a number of preachers have, preachers have said before, uh, press on because Sunday is coming. Uh, and so that would be my right. encouragement. Press on with a community of others. And uh, we can share stories maybe one day around a cup of coffee together about how we saw God uh, work for the flourishing of our neighborhoods. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Jason. Yeah, thank you, Allie. This has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed it. It has, yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, that was just such, um, such an informative and for me, it, it just provided a new way to see Holy Week um, because, you know, as Jason, as, as we talked about throughout the interview and we kind of went really in depth with each, well, not really in depth because, you know, you can only do so much in a short amount of time, but we went um, mm -hmm. into as much as we could each day that he discussed in the book, kind of glossing over some days. Um and, you know, discussing the peacemaking principles that he saw. Um, and I mean, it's, yeah, when, I, when we, when I first heard of, uh, of this book and what Jason was trying to do, it seemed like a pretty radical claim to say that, you know, peacemaking is an interpretive lens through which to see Holy Week, you know, that, um, mm -hmm. that's definitely something for me that I, hadn't heard before or hadn't um yeah I, I guess mm -hmm. and I'm just thinking about you know my own experiences growing up and being in the church and I've heard countless sermons on Palm Sunday and then you know Good Friday and then Easter and those are kind of the milestones in the week and um yeah, I don't think any of them spoke about or were, were framed as um, as Jason frames this week of Holy Week as being, you know, Jesus setting out um, as a peace as as a peacemaker, as someone who's committed to nonviolence, um, and mm -hmm. that the way that Jesus let led his life, not only that week, but you know, in throughout his entire ministry, ultimately, as a peacemaker, ultimately, you know, led to what we see happening on Good Friday. So it was, 
Yeah, it was for me something I um, hadn't heard before. I mean, I, you know, bits bits and pieces, but as um, pre presented in this way, um, I hadn't heard this take. So, um, yeah, I'm wondering if you were, if it was something new for you. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I agree with that because it's just this concept of, kind of putting this into context of Holy Week, the, you know, the call to be a peacemaker, follow Jesus and be a peacemaker is really um, incredible. And I think, yeah, the fact that he was kind of took it upon himself to, um, to do that and to, to think through all of that and write and do that research is um, really incredible and, and gives us a really like, yeah, rich context for Holy Week and, and what it looks like to understand the context of peacemaking within um yeah easter and um and who jesus is so i couldn't agree more yeah right right yeah i um yeah i think moving forward this can really bring new life to um you know my own connection to um, the Lenten season, you know, leading up to Easter, I feel like, um, mm -hmm. yeah, having this framing because yeah, I think in, in past experiences, I've focused on a lot of the, um, self emptying aspects of, of Lent mm -hmm. and the days leading up to Easter and sacrifice and, um, you know, what, what Jesus ultimately gave up. I think that's been kind of the rhetoric around Lent and um, yeah, just focusing on everything. Mm -hmm. Every, yeah, everything that Jesus gave up rather than everything that he brought to the table of um, being someone who contended for peace and justice. And um, yeah, I just going back to the, the peace quote, I think, um, we, if we miss who that, that peacemaking was at the crux of who Jesus was, then we kind of miss, you know, what exactly he was doing in his, um, death and resurrection and something also that, um, that Jason talked about that talks about in his book is how Jesus, had in the opportunity to die on the day of atonement. Um, but instead he chose to lay down his life on Passover. And so, mm -hmm. you know, the day of atonement being about forgiveness and then the day of Passover, of course, being about historically when God liberated the people. And so I just, I thought that was such an interesting point. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. And I, yeah, and I, I love what you're saying about this idea of, like, um, yeah, I think I've also always understood Lent as, yeah, more of that self-emptying um, or, like, you know, giving up something that is enjoyable for you or pleasurable or that you love so that you can sort of um, be able to take in more of God or who God is, um, which, yeah, I think is really still has value and like merit and is beautiful. But I also think right. I love this concept of like, what does it look like to take on the, the cross of reconciliation and peacemaking and, you know, um, do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God, like in the, the passion week, as we call it, um, or Holy week. Right. And yeah. And that's so cool to hear about um, Passover. I had never, like realize that before so that's like mind-blowing to think about yeah just that context of like god liberating his people from oppression and um yeah right. that connection is, is so powerful absolutely yeah and not to um pull the conversation away or, or to get too into the weeds on um one particular day that jason talks about but um i just loved when he was talking about Tuesday, um, which is a day that he says, you know, a lot of times we gloss over because it's when Jesus goes back to the temple and it's kind of teaching after teaching. Mm 
And um, that's when he, you know, says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, and also that's when he pronounces the seven woes. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have read that in the past as like, this is Jesus, you know, really kind of condemning um, and coming down mm -hmm. hard on people like a hammer. And that's something Jason also talks about throughout the book is this, the imagery of God as a hammer and God as a lamb. Um, and you know, making the case that God is not a hammer um, and that, you know, the actions of Jesus are are filled with mercy and love and, you know, not condemnation. And so he makes the same point in this, um, with, with this passage. And mm -hmm. um, he explains how the seven woes and the beatitudes serve as bookends and so um, they are, you know, facing in opposite ways. So the Beatitudes are, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit and these are woe to you. Um, but even though they're facing in opposite ways, their intention is the same. And so, you know, just saying that, you know, God's or, or Jesus's heart in these, in this passage is for restoration and to call these, um, the leaders into something else rather than you know to like it's a, it's an invitation I guess mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say it's an invitation to to change and to turn from mm -hmm. rather than like you know you've you've messed up and now I'm I'm telling you all the ways that um mm -hmm. that you've fallen short it's like it's doing the same mm -hmm. thing um and so yeah I just it's really, that's really stuck with me for some reason, because I think the way that um, connecting it to beloved community, so many of the people that we have talked to are doing something subversive and something that challenges um, and something that, yeah, the, is, is going against the grain, going against the status quo. Um, and many times that involves, you know, holding people accountable or, like contending for justice in a way that um yeah that that has to dismantle something um but i just think that looking at this passage specifically it creates an interesting framework for like how we do that in beloved community like what what is our posture you know is it to destroy and then that's you know period or is it to um to expose flaws in order to like to bring bring those people into something better into into something restored i don't know if this is making sense yeah. but um oh, yeah that, that's the connection i'm making i i yeah i think that's so important and i think you know honestly it can be really easy to lose that kind of posture when we yeah. see such evil in the world, like when we see such injustice and we see, yeah, the pain and suffering that certain people are going through, I think we can definitely lose that um, posture or that approach and understanding that there is a place for calling out, but it's a way of inviting someone to turn towards a better way which yeah I think you articulated so perfectly that it's turning away from that evil and choosing to walk a different path and yeah it's like how do we frame that invitation and Jesus does that for us so we can not that we can right. be Jesus but we can look to him as a model for um how to go about that and I think yeah like you're saying like the Beatitudes is kind of the embodiment of that and what that looks mm -hmm. like um but yeah anyway so well spoken it's such a good point and I think that's so important in the context of beloved community and what we're working towards yeah and I think it takes like coming it takes healing which we've also kind of touched on quite a bit in this mm -hmm. series um in order to I think approach beloved community that way in order to approach um injustice that way it does take healing um on our yeah. part too which i think is 
yeah, it's a really crucial aspect of that process. Right, right. And just, you know, the fact that all of that healing and um, calling out and building something new, like all of that fits within peacemaking and like what peacemaking is like I just think that that's so fascinating that when we talk about peacemaking it's so much bigger and greater and like you know shalom um and what that really means and encompasses it's so much greater than um one might imagine um and so yeah I think holy week is such a such an interesting way to see peacemaking um be fleshed out because it does take us down so many different paths. And we kind of see this with Jesus as a peacemaker, um, you know, calling out um, teachers of the law who were uh, not, not doing justice. And then um, so is, you know, him walking to the cross as is, you know, charging. um, Yeah. Running out the, um, in the temple with the, the court, you know, all of that is peacemaking. Yeah, peacemaking is not something that's light or, you know, just singing kumbaya. Like, it's deep, it's complex. It's right. Yeah, everything we've been talking about in this series, addressing very, um, yeah, deep issues, complex, entrenched, like, structural um, forms of oppression and injustice. And, um, but yeah, that the walking in the ways of Jesus towards shalom is is all encompassing and it's holistic and um, yeah it addresses all of those things like you said. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you listen to podcasts. And for more info about Peace Catalyst and to help support our peacebuilding work, please visit our website at peacecatalyst.org.